Are you ready? Let's go. Let's go. From AMI Central. Now circling in the neutral zone. Here's the pitch on the way. 36 yards for the win. This. Here comes a big chance. The shot is. Is this the tagger? The neutral zone. Oh, oh my God. God. This is as good as it gets. Now, here's your host, two-time Paralympian, Rock Richardson. What's going on? It's time for another edition of The Neutral Zone. I am indeed your host, Brock Richardson. And we did something a little different as we were getting ready to do this show. Our technical producer, Mark Aflalo, asked if everyone was ready to go. And we cheered and said yes, of course. And uh, one thing Claire said when we were doing the yay thing was that kids are back in school. And I followed up by saying, how long is the contract? A day? And everybody seemed to agree that that would be about precise. I'm sure it's longer than a day, but we're a sports show, so we're not going to delve into kids in school in Ontario. Just be happy that the kids are back in school and everyone seems to be on the same page for the time being. My page tells me to introduce my co-host for today. So let's bring in Cam Jacobs. Cameron, how are you? I'm doing great. Work is going well. And uh, this guy is going on vacation in the, uh, to the uh, Dominican Republic in uh, a week from yesterday. So I'm going to be uh, sipping some Coca Locos uh, on the beach probably a week today. So I'm how can I not be happy? Yes, I will be very excited for that same reason in uh, about late June. Uh, early July, I will be disappearing for my own vacation. So I'm right there with you on the hot weather and doing all that. Dominican is very cool. And uh, it's it's one of the places I went to when my sister uh, got married. My oldest sister, she got married in Dominican. And I learned that the sun is hotter in Dominican than other places in North America. And I got... Uh, a certain degree burn on my top of my ask, hand. Is this like a scientific I, experiment that you did that uh, the sun is hotter in the Dominican? Like, how did you figure I, this out? No, but my, my hands bubbled um, <laughs> on about day three of this trip. It was very, very bad. It was awful. They blistered. But the rest of my body was fine because I sunscreened everywhere else except for the top of my hands. So... It's uh, cool. So when you do that, do remember to uh, sunscreen. This is your public service <laughs> announcement for Air the day uh, when you go to Dominican. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, looking forward to hearing about that. And uh, maybe you can get some pictures and we can slide them on uh, one of our podcasts. Uh, when you come back on, as an opening segment, we can all live vicariously through the one and only I Cam will Jenkins. certainly do that. Also joining us is the one and only Claire Buchanan. Claire, how are you? Well, I'm doing fantastic. I'm a little jealous now that you guys are talking about being on the beach and, and getting some sun with uh, how windy and cold it is out today. Well, isn't uh, Cherry Beach nice this time of year? You can't go to that. Oh, beach. yeah. There's there's definitely a lot of beach options in my area, surprisingly. That's, that's one thing I... I realized with living in the city uh, the past few years that there there is a lot of options of beaches, but uh, I think it's it's way past beach time. It's not yeah, the same as Dominican. <laughs> doesn't have that year round <laughs> warmth to it like the DR does. Well, I was just trying to help. Yeah, I was just trying to help you out there. Yeah, that's how we roll in on the neutral zone. We try to help each other out or make each other jealous as we seem to have done in this <laughs> in this opening segment uh let's bring in the informative part of our show and bring you our headlines for this week neutral zone headline headline Big news came out of the CFL almost immediately after our last show. The Hamilton Tiger Cats traded for the rights of Bo Levi Mitchell, which gives Hamilton the first opportunity to offer him a contract this offseason. Mitchell is 23 years old and has played his entire CFL career with the Calgary Stampeders, winning two Grey Cups with the organization as well as two most outstanding player awards. He, If you watched the Grey Cup recently, he was also... Uh, one of the broadcasters. So it will be interesting to see uh, what contract he gets and where. It will be interesting for sure if he gets into the East and Hamilton because that changes the dynamic 
completely to the CFL as to what's going on right now. One of the craziest situations took place on social media recently. It was released that Tom Brady would hope to play in the Canadian Football League one day because, quote, his things seem to be going well outside of the country. And this was in a reference to his recent game in Germany that they won. And, you know, certain things come out on social media and people go crazy over it. I brought this story to uh, one of my hits on uh, Now With Dave Brown. And I didn't even know at the time it was a joke because I believed TSN and all the sources would be bringing this out for us to talk about. But it turns out it was a joke. Uh, and you know what, Brock? At the end of the day, we don't need no stinking Tom Brady because the CFL and the Grey Cup game, it was phenomenal. So don't even bother coming over the border, Tom Brady. Major League Baseball has announced their coaches of the year in the American League. We have Cleveland Guardians coach Terry Francona. And in the National League, we have New York Mets coach Buck Showalter. The Guardians had a record of 92-70. and 70, And the New York Mets, they had a record of 101-61. and 61. Those are your headlines for this week. Let's check on our Twitter poll question. Last week, we asked you... Who do you think will win this year's Grey Cup? Well, 50% of you said the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and 50% of you said the Toronto Argonauts. So the listeners couldn't decide. And as we know, it was uh, the Toronto Argonauts, which we'll discuss later on in the program. This week's question with the World Cup uh, upon us, how do you think Team Canada will do at the World Cup? They, will they be winless? Win at least one game, make it to the knockout stage, not, or win it all. Cast your votes at our Twitter handles, coming at you right now. And welcome back to the Neutral Zone AMI broadcast booth. And we are set to get this ball game underway. The first pitch brought to you by Brock Richardson's Twitter account at Neutral Zone BR. First pitch, strike, and hey gang, why not strike up a Twitter chat with Claire Buchanan for the Neutral Zone? Find her at Neutral Zone CB. And there's a swing and a chopper out to second base right at Claire. She picks up the ball, throws it over to first base for a routine out. And fans, there is nothing routine about connecting with Cam and Josh from the Neutral Zone. At Neutral Zone, Cam J and at J Watson 200. Now that's a winning combination. And this organ interlude is brought to you by AMI Audio on Twitter. Get in touch with the Neutral Zone. Type in at AMI Audio. Joining us today as our guest is one of the most prolific Canadian blind hockey players. He has even been mentioned in the same conversation as Connor McDavid. I'm talking about Canadian blind hockey player Jason Yuha from Rosalind, Alberta. Jason, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Thanks very, very much for having me. So, Jason, when you hear somebody use the words one of the most prolific Canadian blind hockey players ever, and they compare you to Connor McDavid, how does that make you feel? I mean, it's very humbling, obviously, anytime you get mentioned in the same sentence as, you know, the best hockey player in the world. I mean, it's pretty special, but I mean, no way do I think I'm anywhere near that level, but um, it's very humbling and it's very uh, gratifying, I guess, to have the respect and to be thought of as that highly. You've been on the national team for a few years now. What in your mind made this team different than years past? Um, I would say, I guess, our resiliency. Um, our teams in the past, we never really were faced with much adversity. Um, we kind of, we had a full complement of players. Uh, we didn't have any injuries and we were able to basically control all of our games. Like we never really were in danger of losing or anything. And this tournament, we were, we were shorthanded. We, um, a few of our better players weren't able to make the trip. So we were down, you know, to begin. And then two of our better players that did come got injured right at the, at the start of the tournament. So you know, we were discombobulated. We were a short bench. Our lines were all mixed up. Um, we, just, yeah, we were just really short-handed. And I guess it was it was good for us to go through something like that. We haven't really been faced with an obstacle before, so it was good to go through that and 
um, just to see the resiliency of our team, I guess, is something that we hadn't had to show before. So that was something that was different for sure. Now, as I understand, you've played a three-game series against the United States, and you won all the games by a combined score of 19-2. to two. Can you talk about each of your games for us? Sure. Um, game one, I would say there was a lot of nervous energy. Um, we had a lot of first-timers, you know, making their debut on the national team. They didn't really know what to expect. Um, and even some of our returning players, you know, we hadn't had an event since 2019 because of, because of COVID. So there was a lot of anticipation, a lot of anxiety, I guess. We didn't really know how much, you know, the U.S. had improved. Um, and so I would say there was a lot of nervousness, definitely that first period. And then when, you know, two of our better players went down early, now everything was mixed up. Um, yeah, our lines, nobody knew who they were going out with, what position they were going to be playing. But our coaches did a good job of, you know, settling everyone down. And then once we got into the game, you know, everyone got a few shifts under their belt. Um, you know, we started to relax. And, you know, and once we got a couple goals, you know, it was we were able to carry on. So, you know, that was kind of game one. It just took us a while to get going, but once we did, we found our stride and kind of rolled with it. Uh, game two, I would say was probably more a complete game. You know, we knew what to expect right away, so there was no surprises. Um, their goalie actually played really good in game two. So the score wasn't, you know, as lopsided, but, you know, we definitely controlled the majority of the play. And then game three, you know, since the series was wrapped up after game two, game three, there wasn't a whole lot to play for, but obviously still playing your biggest rival, you still want to beat them. But um, I would say it was more dirty, more physical. Just, I think they were frustrated with losing the first two games. They came out, they were chippy. You know, they were playing the body a lot more, using their sticks. So it was definitely a more of a dirty game. But again, we were able to battle through that and, you know, start scoring. And our goalies played fantastic all three games. But yeah, so that would kind of, that's how I would kind of summarize those three games. Obviously, it's not hard to get up for a game against the United States, no matter what game you're playing. Uh, one of your greatest rivalries. And But how hard it is, how hard is it to keep your foot on the gas, even when you guys are dominating as much as you guys have been? Um yeah it, it can be difficult but it was something we talked about going into the tournament you know we've been waiting for this for so long with you know not being able to play the last couple of years that we didn't want to take anything for granted we were we were there for one reason and that was to win gold so we knew you know with, the, with having a short bench and, um, as the tournament went on we knew we were going to be getting tired and they were going to be more fresh so we knew we had to you know play as hard as we could and get as big a lead as we could because we knew they were going to have a push. So I didn't find like it was that hard to, you know, stay motivated because we knew, you know, what we were there for and how long it's been since we'd played that we were going to do whatever we could to make sure we won. Jason, what did you learn about yourself and your team during this event that you didn't know beforehand? Um, I guess I would just say, you know, to stay patient uh, stay composed. You know, in tournaments past, I've kind of had lots of room out there, lots of space. I was kind of able to do my thing. This tournament, you know, I was able to in, in, uh, still, you know, do my thing offensively, but they definitely had a game plan to, you know, try and shut me down. They were double teaming, even triple teaming me and, you know, trying to take away my time and space. So, you know, it's easy to get frustrated in those moments, but you know, I, my coaches did a good job, you know, just keeping me calm, keeping me poised. And I just, you know, told myself to stay patient, you know, my opportunities are going to come. And they did. I just kept working, kept playing our game. And then, you know, the points started coming and I think I still led the tournament in scoring. So it's, you know, you don't have to accomplish everything on that first shift or that first period. You know, it's a long game. And, you know, as long as you're playing the right way and you trust the process, you know, you're going to get the results you want. Even after such a dominating performance, coaches always find a way to tell us things that we can improve on both individually and as a team. Uh, what was that uh, at the end of the series for you guys? I guess, you know, most coaches would say, you know, you have to play a complete game. You have to play a full 60 minutes. 
I mean, I think we did a good job, the majority, but there was always, in each of the three games, there was always that, you know, five minute span where we got a little stagnant. Um, we weren't making clean passes. We weren't getting pucks deep. We weren't back checking, you know, things like that. So I would say, you know, the coaches, that's one thing. I mean, you got to play a complete game. You got to play the full 60 if you want to be uh, victorious. So other than getting that opportunity to wear the Maple Leaf, what's the biggest difference in playing for Team Canada versus your club team? Um, I guess I would just say, you know, having a whole country behind your back. I mean, we all come from across Canada, different provinces, different cities, you know, we all have different backgrounds, but, you know, getting to play together and being one is so cool. It's so, it's so, so much pride in that. And, you know, playing for all the little boys and girls across the country, you know, that dream of being on this team one day is really humbling. And it's really, you know, you feel, you feel really proud to obviously, you know, put on that jersey. But yeah, I would say just having the playing for a country is, you know, something that there's nothing like it. So it's, it's so much fun. We're joined by Jason Yuha, who is a Canadian blind hockey player. And we're talking all about his recent event against the United States. I'm your host, Brock Richardson, alongside Claire Buchanan and Cam Jenkins. What's next for the national team and you personally in your career? Uh, for the national team, um, we're going to keep meeting, you know, do our virtual meetings every month or two. We host Zoom, you know, work team workouts or team building exercises. Uh, we have guest speakers. So that's something we do fairly regularly just because we're all, you know, we can't get together in person very often. So that would be the main thing, you know, is we keep meeting virtually. Um, our next big event will be the national tournament again in Toronto and at the end of March. So that's what we're all preparing for next. Uh, I believe the U.S. will be coming up, so we'll be having probably another Canada-U.S. series. So I would say that's our next big event. Jason, thank you so much uh, for taking the time today to uh, join us on the program. We always appreciate your time and best of luck with the rest of the season. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's always it's always fun to come on with you guys, and I look forward to seeing you guys soon. That was Jason Yuha, who is a Canadian blind hockey player from Rosalind, Alberta. If you like what you hear on this interview or any others we do, here's how you can get a hold of us by voicemail. If you want to leave a message for the Neutral Zone, call now, 1-866-509-4545. And don't forget to give us permission to use your message on the air. Let's get ready to leave a voicemail! What a wonderful interview it was with Jason Yuha and all of us have had the pleasure of seeing uh, blind hockey in one form or another and one of my favorite things that Nico Cartarelli does on uh, Parasports TV when he scores is he does this very dramatic but very cool yeehaw yuha and that's one question uh, we didn't get a chance to ask Jason uh, but it is my favorite thing and i'll tell you a quick story before we get on to chatting about it so when we would be upstairs at the madame athletic center our um headsets would be uh connected to nico and i had no clue that nico does this or would continue to do this and i have cerebral palsy and the reason i bring this up <laughs> is because the first time he did it I jumped so high because it was like, oh my goodness, there's Nico with the yeehaw, yeehaw. And I just think it's so wonderful uh, when that comes up. He has a nickname for like every player in different ways, but the one that really sticks is the yeehaw, well, yeehaw. You say it with more Cameron, feeling than that. Yeehaw, yeehaw. I, I I cannot I <laughs> listen I cannot do it justice so Nor you can did I. you did a wonderful yeah Nico's you did the a guy wonderful <laughs> yeah you did a wonderful attempt at it and it'll be a promo <laughs> near you very soon that little uh, that little yeehaw yeehaw so he's got to cover a uh, women's sledge hockey team or uh, game or something that sounds 
That sounds very, very cool. Yeah, Nico he's, gives all the Nico. nicknames, and yeah, he's awesome for that. <laughs> yeah. N- Nico is one of the um, hardest working people on the beat of Parasports. He uh, goes to a lot of events, and we've had him on, you know, promoting uh, Parasport TV, and he's going to be coming back to promote the uh, Canadian blind hockey championships which are in march but he just wealth of knowledge in in para sports and uh is so good and always loved to have nico nico on and joining us on the program uh let's switch gears to some news that took place recently that uh the toronto blue jays have made a trade that can we say shocked the uh blue jays universe i would say um let me give you the trade breakdown so they traded outfielder teoscar hernandez to seattle for reliever eric swanson and adam mako uh adam uh, swanson excuse me was incredible out of the bullpen uh last season he was uh sixth on the depth chart to come out of the bullpen. So what that means is that when he would come out, it would be sixth in line. So not quite your, you know, um, shut down guy, but kind of more in the higher leverage rather than the lower uh, leverage situations. Um, Mako was a strikeout machine uh, this year. He had... 60 strikeouts in 38 innings and a third in the minor leagues. This also frees up $12 million in cap space. Now, with this trade, before I bring in my co-host, my view on this is the following. Number one, we have to, in order to get over the hump, we have to sometimes make changes. And there's, there's no doubt that Hernandez is a favorite, no question about that. But when you're looking to build, you have to sometimes give up something to get something. If this is how this trade ended today and this is all they did, I'm not a happy camper. But the offseason is still you know, very early, and I think if they do the right thing, like get a left-handed bat, Toronto Blue Jays, please, Um, then I think we can judge this at a later time. But now, Cameron, isn't the right time, and you'll tell me for sure if I'm right or wrong on this. It's the right time to start doing this. Um, This is one domino that is falling. Um, Let's see what ends up happening by spring training because um, getting the reliever, uh, Swanson, um, he was lights out with Seattle, And our bullpen, or the Toronto Blue Jays bullpen, uh, they need help. So it's going to be a great addition for that. Um, But I think the biggest thing here is is that we have $12 million in cap room. Um, We were not going to bring bring, uh, Teoscar Hernandez back with the kind of money that he wanted. So I think it's the dominoes that are going to fall for that lefty hand bat that they're looking for. Um, So is just going to be a matter of finding out, you know, who they're going to get. I think top on their list, um, he might want too much money, though, as well, is Brandon Nemo. So I think that's, you know, I think who the Jays are looking for to get in the outfield. It's a lefty bat. Um, Nemo is really good um, for the Jays um, because of batting left and his average and getting on base. Um, so, and I even think there's going to be a, you know, a few more trades. We still have three catchers at the end of the day. Um, and Alexander Kirk, I believe he just won the silver slugger award. I think he's at, you know, one of his highest values. So if you can trade him to get some, um, you know, uh, another bat in the outfield or maybe, uh, even more pitching help, uh, in the bullpen, I think that's what you're looking for, for trades for, uh, 
upcoming um you know throughout the rest of the uh, winter season agreed claire thoughts yeah I, I agree with you cameron uh aside from the cap space that this opens up uh yeah we we're we're one of very few teams that have a lot of power and uh consistency uh behind the plate as well with catchers you don't see a lot of teams with three really good catchers and as much as uh the blue jays universe would hate to see kirk go and stuff but it's 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 business and we're trying to uh become a better team and and get to a deeper place in the playoffs and 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 be a fighting team for the world series and it's sometimes we've seen uh we've seen some of our favorite play, players go and it's it's in the process of of becoming a better team and more well-rounded team yes we we have very hot bats uh in the dugout and uh very very strong uh pitching but we we definitely need more relievers and um it's it's early in in the trading season as well it's if they're if they're patient and see what kind of comes and goes around uh with other trades and stuff we can we can capitalize on this and i i don't think that we need to kind of jump on the first thing that comes available and uh yeah. i i just i really hope that they take their time yeah and another thing too claire and brock i think is is that taking a look at that uh, starting pitching i think they're going to need help there as well um you know they got manoa and got gausman um at the top of the order and they were probably the most two reliable pitchers along with stripling but i think he's going to want too much money and he's gone um and then you have barrios and he did not have a very good year this year um so he's going to have to bounce back and then you still need a fourth and fifth starter i think they have um and i always forget um this guy's name i you you, you you, yeah, you say you. Kikuchi. Oh, uh, that guy. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, like, <laughs> he was horrible, and I think he's making $10 million a year or whatever he's making. I forget what it is, but, like, they need to send him down to the minors or trade him for a, you know, bag of baseballs. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the day. Like, they've got to get some more pitching. They'll probably be more consistent, yeah. yeah. So they got to, you know, get more pitching help as well, so... And I think they're going to end up having to do that through trade. So, you know, that's another weakness, I think, of the Jays is uh, the starting pitching, which was supposed to be their, uh, you know, their greatest asset. I think uh, you can really only rely on two starters. So you've got to get uh, the third starter kind of Barrios turned around. And then you've also got to get the, uh, you know, a number four and five pitcher. You know what? Uh, like last year, Manoa, yes, he was one of our – best pitchers and but you yes the, the best, best i would argue but when it came to the playoffs you could see his inexperience and he he hadn't been put in that position before so i think that is going to fuel him in the off season and we're just going to see a more consistent uh, manoa and just i mean he's one of those people that just brings the attitude that you want from players too like he's yeah. he's going to have that fire from the starting pitch to when he's called out with Manoa though uh like it was only the first inning that he was bad I believe in the playoffs and then the rest of the innings uh, he was okay if I r remember back that far you know I'm getting close to my 50s so I don't remember like I used to <laughs> but there was also questionable coaching decisions yes absolutely I, I think that's what I, it was more than anything yes. at the end of the day and so I think yeah Manoa I think it was just that one inning and if one yeah. inning's going to do you in when he gave up I think it was three or four runs um if that's going to do you in with the lineup that the Jays have man it's not Alex Manoa's fault in my opinion yeah and the challenge I had with that first inning was that you could, as Claire pointed out, you could visibly see the nerves. You could visibly see it almost looked like he was standing on the mound and you could see, you know, the shoulders be up sort of by his ears and, you know, the, the front side flying open when, when he was throwing. But Cameron, you're right. When your team can't, dig you out of a hole like uh, Alec put the... From the first inning, yeah. they, you got eight innings. It's playoffs, Lots baby. of baseball left, yeah, it's absolutely. It's playoffs, baby, let's go. Yeah. 
No, I think there's a lot. And I, I, I wanted to go back on uh, Cameron's favorite, Yusei Kikuchi, and just say mm-hmm. we, we have to figure out something to do with Yusei Kikuchi. I, I, I'm not sure you're going to get much back for Yusei other than, as Cameron rightfully pointed out, a bag of balls which can be used in, in batting practice, um, you know, to, to test your swing. But they do have another year of control uh, with Yusei. And I think if you're not going to trade him, you need to put him in the bullpen. Because when they did that, he was able to come out at certain times of the year and and do okay. He certainly was not in high leverage situation. I would shoot any manager that put him in a high leverage situation with the bullpen that they had in in the back end of it. But you have to figure out something to do with, with Yusei because I'm not sure, even though we're saying this in jest, I'm not sure a bag of balls is enough for no, it's y- not. Yusei Kikuchi, <laughs> especially when you consider the money that they poured in and the hope you that say- they had for Yusei. With you say the only thing you can do is put him in whether you're like winning by a large amount like if you're up nine to one, put him in there because if he gives up three or four runs and hopefully he spreads that over three or four innings you're still winning, or you do it when you're getting blown out because who cares at that point in time and put him in there it doesn't matter how many runs you get like I don't like you say. Mm, yeah I think you made that pretty, pretty clear <laughs> on today's episode. <laughs> of the neutral zone. I'll be honest, he was. He did get put in in a in a 9-1 game and I remember uh tweeting or putting out on Facebook, I can't remember. I said even my anxiety can't handle a 9-1 lead and yet I see you say and I'm just like, man, this screams like we're giving it up. And if I recall in that 9-1 uh outing he had, he still gave up two runs and made it 9-3 and I was just like oh man we can't have this like we just can't but there was so much promise in signing him for the four years that I think he's been a sort of a a, a big disappointment uh, for the organization because I think they thought that he would be the guy that not necessarily would be a front runner with with you know Manoa and and Gosman and even Barrios but I think they thought he'd be a, a decent fourth starter, and he wasn't even a decent fifth starter at times this year. So, uh, Ross Stripling was just a, a light of, of uh, you know, positivity really when uh, Kikuchi went down, and they said, "Well, Ra- Ross, you're up." And Ross, if it wasn't for him, the the Blue Jays wouldn't have even got into that playoff uh, series at all. Um, just to put a wrap on this conversation, uh, do you guys think that this trade was okay for Teoscar Hernandez? Was it underwhelming? Where do we sit, Cameron? Um, I think it's uh, to be determined. It really depends uh, depends on the other trades and UFAs they do this year. So for me, it's a to be determined. Yeah, I agree. Like uh, he, yes, he's one of the bigger names uh, with the Blue Jays organization sad to see him go but again we have lots of time to see how this unravels and and what we get back with the trade uh so yeah i'm interested to see what comes of it i think the thing i want to emphasize here we don't grade a paper when we're not even a quarter away of the way through the test we can't grade this paper we it's not fair i know uh mark Shapiro and Ross Atkins have been really hit hard in 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 Toronto Maple Leaf fan base. Fine, I think if you look at who they took over for, for you know he was beloved. Alex Anthopoulos, Paul Beeston, that's great. But I do think you have to give them a fair chance in uh, getting things done. And we are only in uh, November, and the season doesn't get going until March if we look at spring training, and then April. If we look at the regular season, so I think I caution people: hold, hold on a little bit, hold your judgment. I know it's hard because, as a fan base in any sport, you want to judge something before it's actually a finished product, and I don't think at this point that's very fair. Uh, speaking of something we can judge, as a 
finished product, and that is the Grey Cup, uh, which concluded a couple of days ago. I want to get your thoughts on the Grey Cup. Uh, a lot of people were surprised by the result. Our poll emphasized that exactly. 50-50, uh, no one could decide. Uh, Claire, what say you on this uh, Grey Cup uh, what? this year? I don't know what this game didn't have. Uh, this is probably one of the best football games uh, in any <laughs> league that I've watched. And it had blocked field goals. It had interceptions. It had turnovers in the last minute. Uh, it just, it was, the second half was just phenomenal sports and phenomenal football to watch. And for it to be uh, a Canadian championship game of all things, it's, it was really fun to watch. And uh, I also am a big fan of an underdog story. So for all those haters that came into that game and, and had Toronto just not even having a chance to take this away. Uh, yeah, I loved watching that, and it's it's so exciting to be a part of. And, uh, yeah, congrats to Toronto. It, I, I watched the game. I'm an Argos ticket holder. I'm going to be a homer here. Um, well, saying that, I was shocked that the Argos won. I really thought uh, Winnipeg was going to win it, um, but they didn't. And like Claire said, this game had everything and it was close all the way through. Um, there was uh, uh, Mwamba. Uh, he ended up getting, and I think it was the second time that a person got uh, best Canadian and MVP for the game. And he was just a beast out there. He ended up having, I believe it was two interceptions. Um, he got some blocked, I think he was the one uh, that got the blocked uh, field goal right near the end of the game. Um, oh man, this game had everything. And I've been so hard on McLeod Bethel Thompson um, because he just always seems to run the ball or give it to the running backs to be able to run the ball. And his passing, I always have not been a huge fan of his because uh, he'll do the short pass or the medium pass but never those kind of long bombs and um, you know he had a few of those the 10 to 15 yard passes uh, which was really good um, but then he ended up being hurt uh, I think he dislocated his thumb and so all of a sudden I see this other quarterback and I still think it's McLeod Bethel Thompson and uh, my friend Ryan, who's a friend of the show, he's been on the show before, he's like, no, Chad Kelly's in the game. And Chad Kelly, he did not miss a beat. And I really think that he was a huge reason why the Argos ended up winning because he was able to move that ball and, yeah, like get that touchdown, uh, Harris. And you also have uh, the ed other guy, A.J. Olette, the two running backs, um, you know, they ran up uh, quite a few yards uh, for the Argos, uh, you know, more so in the early stages of the game. But, like, this was a total team win by the Argos, and their defense is their biggest um, attribute. And they were able to hang with Winnipeg and get some really big plays. And I think the biggest play was that blocked field goal, and that's why they won by one point. It's funny that you guys... Uh talk in this way i think if we look at um andrew harris who is uh in his 30s and winnipeg kind of basically politely said yeah you're getting up there we're gonna we're gonna move on uh from you yeah. and i think andrew harris took that a little bit personally i think i think he said okay winnipeg i'll i'll show you what you're missing and that's exactly what happened i mean we had returned Punts. We, uh, there was things that happened everywhere on 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 the field. It was just wonderful, and uh, you know it's 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 tough because the CFL gets such a, um, a hard rap. You know, like they oh, it's just the Canadian Football League. Oh, the uh, the West we the West again. is so much better than the East. All this, but you know when it matters, it matters in the Grey Cup, and I agree with both of you. That was one of the Just best thinking. games that I have seen in a long, long time. And I think that that was a really great homage to 
Canadian football. Uh, I don't think you could ask for a better game. And Andrew Harris basically said it at, at the end. I'm going to celebrate this with my team because, of course, the first question that gets asked is, what are you going to do next year? Can we let the get like I'm talking to all of media? No, the people want to know. Tell us right now. No, the, it doesn't matter. the game just ended. Oh doesn't yeah, matter. what are you doing? Three hundred and sixty-five days man. from you now. You get the high <laughs> of the Grey Cup. You just won it, and you want to repeat. Like, make a decision, Harris. Let's go. Can we let? <laughs> the, the champagne, no. the beer, come off the ice just a little bit. Like, can we let the 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 wobbly pops, as you call them, you know, go down just a little further before we're ramming a mic in the guy's face? What are you doing next year? Can I celebrate it? Like, please, please, can I celebrate it? And I I, I just want to point out too, like I was at uh, the um, uh, Canadian bocce championships over the weekend and. I woke up this morning uh, at about uh, 6.30, 6.45 in London, Ontario, and I watched the game from start to finish. I uh, hid our instant message group so that I didn't know the score, and I am thrilled that I watched it. It was so good. It was, it was so wonderful. And you know what? Even if Winnipeg won, I would have said still a great game, but just to see Toronto as one of the oldest um, franchises in the CFL winning a championship, that's that's a good thing. And I think, you know, nobody... Yeah, I think it was the 18th win by the Argos. I think that was their 18th great yeah, cup. Yeah, I think you're right, too. And everybody said that Winnipeg would win. Uh, Zach Kolaros would do it. You know, it's uh, th three championships. It's done. Well, this is an example of why you have to play the game. And uh, good on, on the Argos. For, for getting this done. And one of the things that I loved hearing from the, the um, broadcasters is how they they bring out the Grey Cup. And for those of you that might not be able to see it, I want to sort of depict the picture that I saw. So we had uh, two Royal Canadian Mounted Police walking down the steps, and it happened just after the three-minute mark. And the whole time they're discussing, you know, the the history of the Grey Cup and saying that this has been done, you know, 108 times and all that. And it just was so cool. And they don't do that with, you know, the Lombardi Trophy. It's not this big pomp and circumstance. And I love the way they do it. I think it's very cool. Um, would you guys say that that's up there on the way, not necessarily the trophy celebration, but more of how it's presented is it up there for you claire absolutely it's very canadian i like how canadian it is like a couple of mounted police carrying the cfl uh trophy it's i mean in sports it's there's not many things better than that and to have like you said brock to have it explained about the the history of it and and where the game has come from and just it's it's one of those it's <laughs> Remember those Canadian Heritage commercials? It's, it's one of those where you put where you put the uh, the CFL trophy in one of those commercials, and it's just it's one of those things that it's just like yeah, it's it feels good to watch as a Canadian. Totally. Yeah, like uh, okay. I just think if they're gonna like present it, the Mounties, like that's so Canadiana, love that. Um, but I think they need to maybe like have some maple syrup. Uh, maybe some beavers kind of roaming around there too like let's make it even more canadian at the end of the day except you know just not the mounties so instead of beers in the in the change rooms afterwards it's just maple syrup beans, well no you gotta have beer you gotta have beers <laughs> eh come on <laughs> gotta have beers um canadian beers canadian beer canadian yeah yeah better be canadian, canadian beers. beers yeah <laughs> yeah yeah just canadian beers yeah. or whatever supports um the cfl <laughs> <laughs> Better not be an American go. beer supporting the CFL, but whatever, you know, because you got to look to those sponsors. So, but yeah, it's a, it's really nice. It's been around for 109 years and people really need to, you know, take 
a lot of pride in the CFL, I guess is what I'm trying to say, because it's been around for 109 years. Um, they've been playing the same way, and especially in the bigger cities, they need to get more fans there. Um, but I was reading an article where, you know, especially in the bigger cities, there is um, such a melting pot of people. And that's why in the bigger cities, the CFL isn't as popular anymore because it used to be white Anglo-Saxon um, people that ended up enjoying football. And then once it became such a melting pot here, there's so many more options. So I really hope that somehow that they're going to be able to uh, get more people to enjoy the CFL and get more fans out there because it is an absolute fantastic product and it was just the epitome of excitement for the Grey Cup and everyone needs to watch the CFL. Cameron, I'm going to ask you this question and I we're going to move on just in a few minutes on the Grey Cup. We don't have too much longer left, but... Uh, um, I want to ask you, how is this championship, you know, going to be viewed in Toronto? When I've gone to BMO Field, I look, I've sat beside you, I've sat to your left, and I've looked up and I said to you, Cameron, why are those seats empty? And you say, oh, they don't sell those because nobody comes. How is this championship in your mind as a season ticket holder going to be viewed in Toronto? Does it help? Does it hinder? Or do we just have to celebrate it and accept it and hope it gets better? I think you have to accept it and hope it gets better. And when you end up seeing somebody go to a Toronto Argos game, you know, they're the ones. It's word of mouth where you've got to be able to uh, talk to other people and get them excited. Like, I was never a huge CFL fan either, but I saw the excitement from the Bennetts and how much they love it. Um, and, you know, uh, speaking with uh, Ed... He ended up, uh, he's been going to Argo games since he was 12 years old. And I'm not going to say how old he is now, but uh, um, yeah. So like he's been going like for a lot, a lot of years. So it's, you just got to get the word out there, I guess. And other people that like it, get their friends to go. And hopefully they end up having a good time and, you know, doing it that way. I think, uh, you know, another thing is, is that if you do have a dynasty or if you do have um, you know, uh, quite a few championships in a row or, or at least get into the Grey Cup or to the final, East Final, you know, a lot of years in a row or, you know, many years in a row. I think that would really help as well uh, to get more butts and seats. Um, but, you know, and that's a whole different discussion as far as why teams aren't able to get a dynasty in the CFL. And that has a lot to do with, um, you know, coaches and um, players coming and going so that's that's a whole different topic for a different show yeah i agree um let's move on to something else that everybody's gonna jump on or is jumped on or whatever the case is uh for the next um month and that is the world cup and i think a lot of times people look at this and they say I i'm gonna go to my heritage because Canada's not in the World Cup, and so the next best thing is go to my heritage and cheer on that team. Well, in this case, the Canadians are in the uh, World Cup. How do we think they're going to fare? No one is giving them much of a chance in this uh, group. Clara, what say you on this? I don't think that we as a country have extremely high hopes for them going deep into this tournament. I think we're being realistic with that. Um, the big thing is that we're just celebrating that we're there. And I, I am excited to watch these guys play because you can tell from their coach all the way down to their players that they want to soak this up and take it as a learning experience so that they can get back there uh, in the future. So it's, it'll be exciting to watch them play and, and, and see a country, uh, behind them. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've had a couple of, uh, England jerseys in back in my day and growing up with half my f family being right from England and, and immigrants from there. But, uh, yeah, I might have to, uh, add a, uh, Canadian jersey to, to the lineup. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to add a Canadian jersey to my lineup too, but usually I'm uh, going for Cameroon. So that's usually, usually my uh, World <laughs> Cup uh, team is. 
Um, so I, I wonder can't why cheer for them this year. I got a chair for Canada. So it's yeah. I think with Alfonso Davies, um, you know, anything's possible when he's on your team, and as long as he's healthy, there's been discussion whether or not he's going to be able to be part of the first game or not part of the first game, um, or if he's going to be able to possibly play in the tournament. But I think that's going to happen. So. Um, Canada really surprised a lot of people this year. And, you know, if they win one game, I would be very happy. Or even if they were to get a draw, I would be very happy. Um, but you know what? Like, uh, I think Pinball Clemens uh, was saying, um, you know, uh, you know, it would take a miracle to beat uh, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. But Pinball, he believed in miracles. So, hey, I'm going to use the same thing here. You know, I don't know if uh, it's going to take a miracle for Canada to, to, you know, maybe even win a game or to even make it, you know, in the far stages of the World Cup. But I yeah. believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. I believe in them as well. But for what it's worth, uh, Belgium's one of their main strikers whose uh, name I'm not even going to attempt. But uh, one of their main strikers is injured and is out for the tournament. Um that's going to change a lot of things. We need uh, four points to have a potential of going to the knockout stage. I think if we were able to do that, then Canada would be happy. And I think you're going to see national pride really, really, really take place here. And I think that is where we need to look at these things. Uh, having said that, the tournament for Canada gets going on... Uh, Wednesday, so if you're listening to this on Tuesday, then it is tomorrow. So enjoy, get on the bandwagon, and see where we go. That is the end of our show for this week. I'd like to thank Cam Jenkins, Claire Buchanan. Our technical producer is Mark Aflalo. Our manager is Andy Frank. Tune in next week because you just never know what happens when you enter the neutral zone. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you next week. Be safe, be well. <laughs>